It's as if somebody's just meeting 2D styles in the room <laughs> and they're trying to keep up with us. <laughs> okay, got it. So okay. how do human resource strategies align with a company's growth strategy? Well, I think when you have your HR processes clearly defined um, and um, measurable and ready to implement as you scale, then your HR should be in place so that it, it aligns with the business to scale. So if you want to go and hire 100 people, what does that look like? How can we be efficient in our recruiting processes? Um, and you know, do you have the technology and the tools and the resources in place? So everything kind of works together. Um, I used to love when I would go into client meetings and, you know, a CFO would say, oh, you know, our business goals have nothing to do with people. And I'd be like, okay, well, tell me, some, you know, a little bit more about like, you know, what are your pain points for this year? And I would leave with a page full of notes and, you know, activities on things that I could help them with because at the end of the day, everything relates back to your people. Your people are the one running the business. So, um, so they, they have to be closely aligned together. A few moments ago, we were talking about uh, DISC, and I know you're an expert in DISC, and we are talking about our high D styles. Now, just in my mind, when it comes to these HR policies and processes, how do those D styles respond to HR policies and procedures? <laughs> Are they prepared? <laughs> Have they had the patience to put them together? Um, well, Ds don't really like being told what to do. Um, so when, as an HR person who happens to be a high D, um, I have mastered the art of helping business owners kind of see that it, it's their idea and, and not telling them what to do, but sort of, um, I guess, persuading or selling to get them on board with whatever policy that is. And usually if I can, if I can pin it back to um, a compliance issue or a potential fine or something like that, that tends to get their ears perked a little bit. <laughs> I was meeting with uh, two clients the other day, both D styles and one's saying it's my way or the highway. <laughs> and I said to his business partner, don't give him your opinion. Just give him some options. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and I love that because you know, the, the D style is moving at such a fast pace and they look at this compliance and for them in their mind, it's slowing them down, preventing them from getting that result. But they need to be compliant. They yeah. need to have those policies in place so they can scale and grow. And especially if you have to bring in 100 people onto your team, that's a lot of process. That's a lot of yeah. policy. It's a lot yeah. of procedure and if they're not ready ultimately they're going to fail and, and right. they fear failure just as much as the other styles but right. they don't tend to show it externally right now thinking about work uh, we've had the introduction of remote work we're thinking about diversity and inclusion and the employee well-being as you look out into the future of work what does the future of work look like i think we are in such an interesting time right now. I was just thinking about this the other day because you see the rise of AI and ChatGPT and all these things that are going to affect HR. How is AI going to affect hiring? And I read a headline the other day about how AI is going to fire employees someday. I don't see how that's going to work, but you know, the future is near. So we'll find out. Um, you but know I think, our people will like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> but at the same time, people are craving human interaction. So you've got this like imbalance between how technology is going to push us forward as a society and also craving human connection. So I think the art of HR, and I do think it's an art, I think the art of HR is going to be finding that balance for whatever the company is. And I think each company's footprint is going to look a little different and finding that right balance between, okay, how can AI push us forward and how can we measure things that we weren't able to measure in the past and use that to make informed decisions while also providing a greater human interaction. So I think, if, I think that's going to be the focus um, for a big part of HR. And then secondly, I would say, there's a greater need for managers to learn um, not how to manage um, the time clock, as I like to say. You know, I think there, the reason why there's this big push, push and pull between employees and companies between are we going to the office or are we not is because managers don't really 
I'm speaking very general, but managers typically do not know how to manage when they can't see the person. They only know how to manage when the person arrives and leaves. And so if you've got a job where you can do it from home, I think teaching and learning that skill of emotional intelligence, which I know you talk a lot about, and communication and behavioral-based kind of learning, um, I think that's going to be a much-needed skill in the future. So I think when I think about the future of HR, those are the three things that kind of come to mind. Mm. You, you're mentioning here the relationship is so important, and DISC is a technology that we can understand others really quickly and to build those relationships. How do you see DISC becoming a part of the future of work? I know it's important now. Will it become more important in the future? Absolutely. I was just having this conversation with someone yesterday. I said, I love DISC because what DISC does is it takes out that personal attack almost, you know, when, when you're saying like, um, you know, your, I, I call the C's the question masters, you know, they, they start asking a bunch of questions and as an I, a DI, if I don't have the answers, I'm like, I like want to shrivel and crawl under my desk. Um, and I'm so, <laughs> right, I'm like, I'm being attacked. Um, but so, um, with this, um, when you, when you can, uh, separate it from the, I guess just the way that we're wired and say, your C is driving my eye a little bananas so and I'm going to need you to taper that down for a minute. It, that comes across so much better than being like, you're asking me a million questions and you're wearing me out, you know? So I think being able to have that common language and to say like my, I'm on a group project right now with some people. And the other day I was like, my D's coming in hot guys, you know? And I, I just like went, you know, and asked them all of my questions of where's this and where's that? Cause it was very fast paced and I didn't want to wear them out. Um, so I think, you know, having those warning labels and having that common language um, is really going to be imperative as we, you know, continue to crave that human interaction and learning those soft skills as managers. So I think it's going to be great. It's fascinating to see how understanding DISC in the workplace is really important because you get the visual cues. You can see the observable human behaviour and you can start to pick their style before they even open the mouth. Mm -hmm. And even now that we're using more technology Zoom, emails, and WhatsApp, we can pick it very quickly through the online interactions. And mm -hmm. one of my clients the other day, uh, I think with a lot of businesses, he's a high D, he's really results driven, he's really pushing forward to solve the problems, and he loves the challenges, but he's yeah. very big picture. So his team, who's predominantly high C, they write him these long WhatsApp <laughs> messages. And he's scrolling and he's scrolling and he's scrolling through. <laughs> he's, he's brain short circuiting. And he replies to their three page message with a thumbs up, with, a, with an emoji. And yeah. his team go bonkers. They're like, how is it that I write this three page message? It's articulate, it's spell checked, it's been run through chat GPT, and all I like it is a thumbs up. Yeah. And it creates this sense of confusion. And he's saying, well, my thumbs up is equivalent to your thousand words. Like I'm saying, <laughs> yeah. yep, I'm good. I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah. And so we're seeing some of those challenges in that culture. So in the workplace, he gives them a thumbs up. But now they've got to translate that onto the online world <laughs> with a thumbs yeah. up on WhatsApp. And, and I see that from my perspective, that it's so important for them to transition from, yes, understanding it face to face and being able to pick it digitally. Yeah. So we don't overwhelm people. Yeah. So that our C style email that's 10 pages long doesn't attack the high eye style and their creativity. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's interesting. Now, HR has been important in all businesses since the beginning of time, but it's also changing. So from your perspective, how is human resources changing? Well, you know, so I started my career a while ago and um, I remember in my early days and even when I was in college, I'm one of the weirdos who majored in HR. And they always talked about how HR had only recently got a seat at the table. And I will tell you in my experience, um, that hasn't always been the case from what I've seen because there's, it's still very much finance, sales, marketing, 
Um, and I think the pandemic really pushed HR to the table. Whether or not business owners want to listen to HR, they realized, oh, I need to pay attention because these people actually know what they're talking about. And so I think I've just seen such a greater demand um, since 2020 in HR as a whole. Um, and I think that's only going to continue to grow as we navigate all these, you know, <laughs> I was just looking at the latest HR magazine and, um, you know, there was the great resignation and then there was the great something else. And now there's the great compromise. And I'm like, okay, we can't keep having the greats. Like at some point, you know, this is just our new normal. And I think our new normal is tumultuous waters that we're going to continue to have to navigate and figure out, which is why there's such a demand for HR. So. I heard about the, the great resignation and then I heard about the quiet quitters. Oh, that's, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's a very important topic. Uh, that has to be addressed. You know, a, a lot of businesses, they don't calculate the cost of high turnover. They don't yeah. track it. And the rate of turnover is going up. The cost of employment yeah. is going up. I was reading some numbers the other day. If you release a second tier manager or if a second tier manager quits early, the negative impact on the business is $850,000, US dollars if a second tier manager leaves. But most business owners aren't tracking this cost. Mm -hmm. Also, when we have to bring somebody into a business, it can take up to 100 days from the first interview until the onboarding. Also, they said with the latest numbers that 10 times more people are quitting in the first year mm -hmm. than in the fifth year of business. Yep. And somebody has to solve it. And it's going to be the, the entire business, but there has to be a section of that business such as HR who's always got their eye on this because if the company doesn't solve that there's going to be water leaking out of their bucket continuously and they're going to try to figure out where's the profitability going mm -hmm. and, and I think for a lot of businesses they just don't know when to engage HR services you know we talk about the growth phase so many people just jump into business like the high eyes. I'm so yeah. optimistic. <laughs> I believe I can have a million dollar business. Yeah. And they don't engage HR. A lot of D styles, they get into that growth curve and they say, because of me, because I'm pushing so hard, this business is just going to grow, grow, grow and grow. And before they know it, you've hit the success trap, the founders trap, and you're back into a decline. Yeah. So when should a business or when's the best time that a business should engage in HR services? So I don't, I don't think there's a bad time. So like I, I have companies who have engaged from the get go, they pour, form a partnership with somebody and they say over the next 12 months, we're going to hire five people. Um, here's what um, here's what our hiring plan is. What do we need to do? And then we get their books in order. We make sure they have their onboarding process, their ha employee handbook, and they got a you know good payroll provider. All that like infrastructure to be able to scale and grow. And then I think as you scale and grow, your HR needs change. So you go from sort of like um, infrastructure and task oriented to strategic and looking at those things. I mean, the more, the more employees that you have, the more data you have and the more fun you can have <laughs> if you're a nerd like me, um, and like to look at the data and things and you can interpret, you know, different behaviors and how's this manager doing versus that manager. And, um, you know, what are our performance metrics and things like that. So there's never a bad time. And honestly, I think if you know, you're going to be hiring one or two or three people, it, that's when you should engage HR because if you have it right from the beginning, then you're just a well-oiled machine from then on. But if you're, if you wait until you have 15, 20 employees and you've got the executive assistant doing it, then you're going to be playing catch up, you know, and then it'll always feel like you're playing catch up because you won't ever, the likelihood that you get to a place where you can start to be strategic, it will take a while to get there if ever, you know? So, um, I think from the beginning. 